Well, what you see here is sort of my favorite coffee in Brussels. I do live in Munich. I'm actually currently in Munich, but I really appreciate going to Brussels to enjoy this cup of coffee and having my uh, laptop next to me doing some productive work outside of my home office. I'm sure most of you um, will have spent um, a lot of time in the home office. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can type in the chat whether uh, this is the case. Actually, the ones who are very happy about it are my cats. Maybe you can just uh, type in, your, in the chat whether you have a cat or not, because I recently read a book, The Translators, tend to have more cats than non-translators. So rather than asking you, where uh, are you from and which country, country are you sitting? My question is just, do you have a cat or not? Okay, by the way, this is the location of my favorite coffee and cafe in Brussels. It's the Galerie Saint-Hubert, downtown Brussels. And it's a really enjoyable place to work in when I'm traveling with my notebook. And when you're traveling, which you might not have done too often in the past 18 months, yeah, then you might have been forced to work from a place like this because your flight is delayed and you're standing or sitting in front of the gate and you can use the opportunity to again do some translation work. I was quite lucky, by the way, in October, my workplace looked like this. And this is, guess what? It looks a bit like Singapore, Marina Bay area, but it's not as far away as Singapore. This is Valencia. La Ciudad de las Artes in Valencia, a very modern place with great cafes and restaurants again, so a very enjoyable place to work at. And for some of you, this might be even nicer. It's the beach of Valencia. So it's really a dream to have a workplace that looks like this. Some people prefer a more, more cozy environment. So this is sort of the Swiss chalet touch. And uh, when you're roaming around, your workplace definitely should not look like this. I think we all agree with technology from the 80s and 90s, it would have been very difficult to uh, have a workplace other than your office. Let's take a look at an alternative. Yeah, I think this looks a lot better, yeah? but even a notebook can get pretty heavy when you need to carry it a lot. So I just remember one episode um, a lot of years ago, I, I touched down in New York or rather New Jersey airport. I had this notebook with me and it was 7 a.m. in the morning. I took a cab to the hotel, which was well in Manhattan. And at the re reception desk, they told me, Mr. Sharma, welcome, but you're a bit early. Yeah? Your room is not ready until 3 p.m. So I had to walk around Manhattan with this notebook, and it really felt heavy after a few hours. So my shoulder was aching, and the battery had run out, which is another problem because it's not only the notebook that you need to carry with you, it's the charger, and then you have to find a plug, uh, otherwise, the battery will only last two or three hours. And sometimes I go to Starbucks, desperately looking not for the nicest seat, but for a seat that has access to a plug, or rather an, an, an outlet for my plug. Yeah? So it's much more agreeable to work with a machine that looks like this. So this is a Surface computer. A convertible, you can use it as a tablet, you can use it like a notebook if you have a keyboard attached to it, and perhaps a mouse. The downside of this is you have to go for the really expensive models, which are almost as big and heavy as a notebook, because the lower uh, models that only cost about 600 euros and uh, that weigh about one pound, they're not very powerful. So the SSD is limited in size. So it's nothing where you can install, I don't know, the entire Adobe Creative Suite. I think for an application like SDL Trader Studio, it's all right. But if you need a powerful machine that opens a big XML file, not in 10 minutes, but in 10 seconds, um, the lower surface uh, models are not really the way to go. An alternative is this. I like it a lot better. 
uh, so an iPad, but here the situation is even worse because you can't run Windows or Studio, Drado Studio, on an iPad. Um, the good thing is an iPad is lightweight, it's less than a pound, um, the battery lasts an entire workday, so you don't need to rely on an uh, outlet to be available when you go to your favorite cafe or restaurant to do some work. And by the way, before I start with my live software presentation, I should um, advertise this link, the charters.com landing page for the Expo Lingua price draw for November 2021. The price, by the way, just in case you're interested, is not uh, an iPad or a Surface computer. It's a freelance edition of Studio 2001, so the latest flavor of Studio. So even if you can't win an iPad, I would still appreciate if you take this link to go um, um, to our landing page. So let me just put it into Chrome. Yeah. So here you see the price draw. So just to give you an idea of what the page looks like. So we have to enter some information, first name, last name, and so on. And as you can see, I am doing the presentation for the first time ever, not on a Windows machine, but on a MacBook. So I could also have done this uh, on an iPad. I was just not sure whether I can really do this with Zoom and so on. So I didn't want to go for a tablet, so I kept to a MacBook. But as you can see, no windows whatsoever, because I would like to introduce you to the cloud, which is Trados Live. And you can use it from uh, whatever machine that can run a web browser. The good thing, it's platform independent, so you don't need to go for a Windows machine. A lot of freelancers and roadshows have been asking me, can you run Studio on a Mac? And the answer is no, you need to virtualize Windows or use Bootcamp or whatever third party technology to run Windows and thus Studio. But when you work with Trados Live, you just need a web browser, Chrome, Safari, Firefox, Edge, whatever. And the power is in the cloud. So it's not like you're installing a five gigabyte software on a small computer. So the entire application logic is hosted in the cloud. Of course, you can still work in Studio. This is why the price draw offers Studio. But you can do a lot of work in a web browser already. And for this, you just need like a 10 inch uh, Microsoft Surface or an iPad mini, and then you can manage your projects and be productive even while you're standing in a queue. And I've already logged in to Trados Live, our cloud-based solution. I have a dashboard where I can see the current situation, like how many projects I've created. They're not too many because I like uh, doing this presentation on a sort of clean system, which is not um, overwhelming you with hundreds of projects and clients and so on. So I would like to have a clean slate because it makes things clearer. And your resources are uh, located in the cloud. And this is one of the reasons why I prefer a cloud solution to a desktop-based solution, because I took my notebook in New York with me. I didn't leave in the, in the hotel because I didn't have a room uh, because I was afraid of losing the data. Now, yeah? if I lose the machine, tough luck, but I can go to Circuit City and spend $1,000 on another machine if the data is not on the computer itself. So, so wherever I go, I have access to my translation memories. So for example, when I want to take a look at the content of the sample TM, English, German, I can do it in a web browser. Yeah. And for the first time ever, I see translation memory content uh, searchable from a web browser. So here, for example, I can open a filter and say, show me all the units that contain the term uh, terminology, not very creative, but it will do for a presentation. And then I can freely search my memory from whatever end device. Yeah, so you get the idea. I'm not going into the details here, otherwise I would spend the entire half hour on showing you how to browse a translation memory. Terminology is the same thing. 
So I can have uh, terminology databases hosted as well in the cloud. Um, let me just take a look. Where do I have my term bases? Yeah, here, for example, there is a term base that I can open and search or add new entries. For example, if I want to add the entry um, dialog box, dialog felt, I do it directly here in the web browser. And in English, the term uh, is dialog box. And of course, I can add fields like notes and definitions. For example, this is a test. Yeah, and I can also apply character formatting. I can and insert pictures. I can add cross references and so on. And this allows me to access, well, the terminology di directly from the web browser, as you can see. So to sum it up, wherever you go, you have your resources with you, um, terminology and translation memories. If I want to get work done, so for example, a client sends me um, a file to translate. I just need to resize my web browser because I'm now working on a 14 inch screen. So um, let me just make the web browser available. I wanted to actually create a new project. Yeah, the button is here. And this is something that you can do from the web browser. And by the way, also from a smartphone. There is a Trados Live app for Android and uh, iOS available. So you can spend unproductive minutes standing in line for creating projects and for tracing projects. So let me call this Expo Lingua Test Project. I can define a due date or I even must define a due date. Um, I'm going to go to Stockholm on next Monday. So it needs to be finished before Monday, uh, 12 o'clock, then I select what we call a location. So you might want to work for, or you might have to work for different customers. So here there's Kunde A presentation. Let's put the project in the presentation folder. And then I select a project template. So I've pre-configured this so that I don't lose time um, showing you how to configure the Trados Cloud. Suffice it to say, I have some project templates and I translate this from English into German. Then I browse for my file. So there's a sample file and I can directly click on create and start. But before I do this, I want to give you some insight into the language resources that are used in the background. So in the background, I use a translation memory, sure. I'm also using a machine translation system. So whenever nothing is found in the sample TM, um, the segment will be pre-translated using neural machine translation. You can leave it out, yeah, you can remove this, but I leave it in because I don't want to waste your time by showing to you how I translate. So the machine translation will give me a lot of pre-translated segments. And I include two terminology databases. My workflow is going to be very simple, by the way. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, I'm just doing a translation here. If I am a standalone translator and I don't have anybody else to do the linguistic review for me, I can just exclude the review. And that's it. So I click Create and Start. And the entire processing power is in the cloud, as I said, you can do this with a low powered tablet PC because the real power comes from the cloud computer who has just created this project for me. And when I click on it, I can see that the pre-processing is ongoing. What does pre-processing mean? It means that the original file is converted into the SDL format. The file is um, pre-translated using the memory or memories. It is also pre-translated using, in this case, neural machine translation, and the analysis report is generated. So I'm a bit impatient now, so I need to click on refresh a couple of times to see how the pre-processing is ongoing. 
uh, yeah, in real life, you are not going to sit in front of your machine all the time, impatiently waiting for the bar to move to 100%. In real life, you would get an email. So you do some different work or you just order another cappuccino in the Galerie Saint-Hubert in Brussels, and then you get an email once the file is ready for translation. Yeah, I think the file should be ready. As you can see, the machine has pre-processed everything. Uh, it has also generated an analysis report, which you can view here. So it's a very simple and small file with just six segments inside. Five segments have been pre-translated using machine translation, and one segment has been identified as a context match from the memory. Yeah, and now after pre-processing, the translation comes into play. This is me, I need to do the translation, and I can do it in studio. Yeah, studio still has, has a raison d'etre, of course, and most of our customers want to work with a thick client. But it's also possible to do this. I'm going to accept my own job. Doesn't make sense to reject my own job. And then I open it in online editor, which is the web browser again. Studio is possible, but since I'm on a Mac operating system, I can't do this. Uh, so let me open this in online editor. And this is sort of studio in the cloud, in the web browser. Let me just zoom in just a little bit, which makes the text a bit easier to read uh, for you. As you can see, the first segment has been confirmed and it has been marked as a 100% match or context match, whereas the other segments have been pre-translated using neural machine translation. So I can just go over the first segment because it's a 100% match. And by the way, on the right-hand side, I can see further information. For example, um, yeah, hyperdrive should be hyperantrieb in German, and the machine translation guessed it right. Does an hyperantrieb beschädigt wurde, steuerte Han Solo ihn in ein. But I think Planetenfeld for asteroid field is not good. So this terminology is suggesting Asteroidenfeld. Asteroiden felt, so I have to replace the uh, term. And then I confirm it. So if you're familiar with a side by side uh, translation environment, you will immediately take to the online editor, because it's exactly the same principle. This uh, felt is planetoid, so you have to do some post editing. Das Asteroiden felt war so dicht, dass die imperialen Sternzerstörer es nicht uh, okay, betreten, I don't like the term, but I'm not going to polish the document right now. Same here, allerdings setzen die TIE Fighter. It's really TIE Fighter. You can see the terms even pop up in a sort of auto-suggest um, fashion and so on. Let me just go over the text quickly. Die ex -Flügel Jäger, not Kämpfer. So according to the terminology, this is not correct. And last but not least, uh, Luke Skywalker goes to the Jedi Master Yoda to learn more about the Force. And the Force has been translated with, indeed, Macht, which is correct. By the way, this online editor even has full preview capabilities. So you can um, put the word-based preview side by side. But in this case, I have to collapse uh, the lookup panel because it's taking too much space. So depending on whether you have an iPad Pro with the full range of uh, inches, so 13 inches, you have enough real estate on the screen to display yeah, the preview. If not, of course, you need to disable the preview. But we have preview capabilities here for PowerPoint, Excel, XML, HTML, etc. So once I have finished my translation, I just need to confirm the last segment. So there's a confirmation icon here. I complete the job. I say complete task. And I'm now leaving the online editor section to go to my projects view once again. So here there's the Expolingua test project, which I'm going to click. 
because the finalization is going to be done by the machine itself. Yeah. What does finalization mean? In Studio, it's dispatch task finalized that updates the translation memory and that generates um, the final text to deliver to the client. So this is automated as well. I'm now a bit impatient because the bar is not moving. If you want to get more information, more detailed information, then you go to the task history, which is a sort of uh, lock. And here I can see the steps that were performed. So here I can trace that I, Zia Chama, I finished the translation on November, about, well, two minutes ago. So you have a complete um, trace record, which is good for accountability. And now the system is currently, um, yeah, as you can see here, updating the translation memory. And if I refresh, I can see the target file generation has also been completed. Okay. And this means that when I go to the file menu or files menu, I see the translated file and I can see the original English file. And if I want to deliver the translation, I have of course to download it. You see the download link here. And by the way, in the, in the background, I heard an email chime. Um, so the system has alerted me that the file is ready for download. Because as I said, in real life, you will not be staring at the screen the entire day. Oh, is the file finalized? No, um, you will be notified. The downloadable files are by default zipped because if you have uploaded not this little Star Wars text with six segments, but 100 files with uh, 10,000 segments, it's better to zip up all the files. This uh, also accelerates the download. And in the download uh, folder, when you unzip it, you will find yeah, this here. Of course, this was a very simple text. We support uh, complex text with formatting and complex layout and so on. But for a demonstration, I'm uh, keen on using a simplified document. And last but not least, before you uh, drink up your cappuccino and move to uh, the next um, location, you can complete the project. This just means that the project is going to be marked as complete. So in my list of projects, I see the completed flag. And that's basically it. That this is what you can do with Trados Live. Maybe I repeat the steps. I can create yet another project because I see that I still have about five minutes left before we can go into the meeting room for questions and discussions. So I pro uh, provide a name, another project. I put this into the location presentation. So if you have different customers, my advice is to create uh, one location per customer so that you don't mix memories or projects belonging to different customers. Of course, you can also add more than one file. Um, yeah, let me just add the same file again. Why not? It doesn't hurt because I'm not really doing any translation work anyway. Then I select my template. Uh, or this time, let me say, let's do Spanish as a target language. Yeah? The translation engine. I told you, uh, contains memories, machine translation. Uh, here I see that no machine translation for English Spanish has been selected. So let's do this. As you can see, we support the Trados language weaver, but it's also possible to link to other machine translation providers, uh, but you need a license for that. So if you don't have, for example, a Bing or DeepL license, you can't really use this productively. And you have your term basis. Um, there are also lots of settings, which I'm just going to tease. So all the settings that you know from Studio, like the QA checker, the segment verification, the punctuation verification, you can configure all of this in the web browser. But as I said, I'm just teasing this because there are like dozens of hundreds of project settings that you can now configure directly in the web browser. And then you, then you click create and start. 
to have the project prepared. And it's the same story again. So the project is about to be pre-processed. And in the task history, uh, you find more details. If you are uncertain about what is happening, go here. So this is like the log where you can see all the tasks like conversion, pre-translation, analysis, etc. They should pop up. Okay, for the moment, it's the file type detection that's ongoing. And I would say some questions have uh, piled up in the chat. Um, while it's preparing, let me just take a look. Uh, okay, Arabic, German. My question is, if I do not have texts in digital form and these texts are in Arabic, how can Trotters help me? Yeah, they need to be in digital form. So you can uh, put in files in PDF, for example, or any kind of electronic format. But if it's sort of um, yeah, on paper, you have to scan it and convert it into a PDF. It depends on the quality here. If you have a fax uh, with coffee stains on it and it's uh, not legible, then Trotters will a hard time reading this as well. So you need the documents in some electronic form. Yeah, it uh, reads PDF, so PDF is supported, but again, it depends on the quality. Um, I was once in Kazakhstan and then I saw some certificates for oil exploration and there were sort of yeah, dirty oil stains on them, no kidding here. So that was really hard to get them scanned. I once scanned um, the leasing contract for my car. Uh, it was a 300 DPI scan and it was flawless. But as soon as the letters are fuzzy, imagine you have a hard time reading. Imagine how hard uh, it is for a machine to recognize the characters. Okay, and as you can see, the analysis is now being done. Uh, oh, another one, Charles is good in Arabic. Um, yes, inshallah, I would say, or rather akid. Uh, Trados is good in Arabic and let's say in languages where you write from right to left, which is sometimes a challenge because sometimes the directionalities clash. If, for example, you have English text embedded in Arabic text, but we did a lot of testing also with uh, customers in uh, various Arabic countries and the feedback usually has been very good. So Trados is fit for Arabic, yeah. Hebrew, the same. So we do have partners also in Arabic, uh, sorry, in Israel who have been testing this and who have given us valuable feedback for what we call bi-directional languages. And I think my time is sort of over. Yeah, I should have the translation into Spanish right here. And just for good measure, uh, I'm accepting it. Yeah and I'm opening it in the online editor. I can, of course, keep talking about the online editor and translation for the entire day. I'm not going to do this. I'm just showing this to you in Spanish. Uh, yeah, the term recognition is flawless here as well. It would also work for Arabic. Also neural machine translation works uh, for Arabic. So Language Weaver provides engines for Hebrew, Arabic, also Chinese and Japanese. And you have a range of functionality, like you can comment, you can track changes, yeah, if you want to change anything. Yeah, something like this, for example, um, just teasing these. So this, this is a very feature rich environment. I'm going to take a shortcut here. I would love to talk about this more, but I think my time is running out. I think on my iPad, I'm running the counter, which tells me, Zia, do you have 20 seconds left? Uh, this is why I'm going to end the presentation here. So thank you very much. And also, since we have some Arabic speakers here, shukran jazilan. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing. And I think you can join me later in this um, dedicated um, discussion room.